If you have a Bible, go with me over to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Let's go. And I'm going to read this out of the NIV version, but you can look at other versions when you go home because I think every version speaks to us. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Let's read it together. Ready, read. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your what? Heart. For everything you do flows from it. Today's message is entitled, The Hard Work of Heart Work. Everybody say, The Hard Work of Heart Work. And our goal today is to really help you go home and do the hard work, making sure that you have the right kind of heart towards God. You know, there's some of you all who are here today and your marriage is hanging on by a thread and God wants to restore your marriage, but you got to go home and do the hard work of the heart work. There are some of you all who are here today and you've been battling addiction and God wants to break the addiction off of your life and give you freedom, but you got to start to do the hard work of the heart work. There are some of you all who are here today and this is your church, but you're wrestling with it and you don't know if you want to be at this church and you just don't feel connected to this church. You don't feel connected to other people. And it's not because people aren't being healed here and saved here. It's not because the word is not clear and the worship is not good. The problem is, is that you got guards up. You got guards up from the pain that you've been through before and you've made some incorrect assumptions and you got to be willing to do the hard work of the hard work. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. You know, I've been saved for 34 years, y'all. I've been in ministry for over 23 years. As a lead pastor, I've been a lead pastor. Next month, we're celebrating 17 years of ministry. Come on, somebody. Time flies when you're having fun, right? And we've been through some amazing highs. And we've been through some incredible lows all at the same time. We've seen God heal cancer, and we've seen God not do things or maybe prayers that we've prayed, and we said we thought it was going to be this, but we've got that. And through all of it, my main goal has been let's have a pure heart. I want to maintain a pure heart through the highs and the lows and every season that we go through. I'm telling you, you want to have a goal where you want your heart to be pure. That's my main goal. It's not to have a big church. It's not to have more campuses. All of those things are peripheral goals. All of those things are secondary goals, but my goal and hopefully your goal after today is that you want to be a person who has a pure heart. You know, and I've noticed over the years that a lot of people start off with a pure heart, but it doesn't mean they end with one. And I think we need to put a premium not on how we start, but on how we end. There are so many people that they start off walking with God, but will you be with him in six months? Will you be with him in six years? It's easy to start a new adventure at the gym. It's easy to start a new relationship with somebody that you're dating. But the question is, how will you end? And I'm living my life right now where I want to end well. Is there anybody else that wants to end well? I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So I don't want to just say I had a a pure heart in my 20s. I want to have a pure heart in my 70s. I don't want to just have a pure heart in my 30s. I want to have a pure heart in my 90s and beyond. I want to start well and I want to end well. And I believe with all of my heart that today is an invitation. God is inviting you to another level of manifestation. He is inviting you. The reason that you're in church right now is an invitation from God to say, why don't you step into another dimension of a purity of heart? For those who have a pure heart, they shall see God. And so I have a vision, and the vision of our church is to see thousands of people of different nationalities, ethnicities, races, backgrounds, or what the world calls races anyway, backgrounds and cultures all worshiping God on one accord. You know, this is an election year. And please don't let social media or popular opinion fool you to think that we should behave like the world behaves. And they're going to divide based upon political lines and the color of our skin and melanin and all of that. And to all of that, we say whatever. Because the Bible truth is that we're in the eyes of God, one race, the human race with different ethnicities, melanins, cultures, nationalities. But we all come from one blood. And I want to ask you and recruit you to help us guard that culture in an election year. I'm going to ask you, no matter if you're black as night or white as snow, to please embrace people that don't look like you, think like you, vote like you, and show them the love of Jesus. You say, what is the vision of our church? That's just who we are, like it or lump it. Come on, somebody. All right? I see thousands of people of different ethnicities, backgrounds, and cultures all worshiping one God as family, all pursuing having a pure heart. What does that look like when we have thousands of people in different cities and different campuses that all just have a pure heart, not a perfect heart, but a pure heart? 
See, David wasn't perfect, but he was pure hearted. That's why we still talk about him. It wasn't that he had it all together. It was just that he knew how to get it together when he messed things up. And what is the culture when people have pure hearts? That means that our culture is filled with people that are kind and graceful and grateful and thankful and submitted and servant-hearted, and generous, come on somebody, and forgiving, come on somebody, and all of those things, that's what makes our church what it is, and we want you to have that kind of heart no matter what's going on in the world. That's our goal, and that's our vision, and you're in the right place today. So I want to define the heart if we can. If you're a note-taker, write this down, because when we're talking about the heart, we're not talking about the, the, the organ that is protected by your rib cage that's pumping blood through your body. Mm -mm. When we talk about the heart in a biblical context, write this down, we're talking about the core of our being. Everybody say, my core. The core of who you are. We're talking about the center of your existence. Everybody say, my center, my center. Let me make it plain. We're talking about your spirit. Everybody say, my spirit, my spirit. I've always taught, and I still believe, that we're three-part makeup, just like God is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but it's one God. We are a spirit, soul, and body, but it's just us. We, have, we are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body, and here's the good news, that the body part of you that you see is your earth suit, and it's not the real you, because from dust you came to dust you're going to return. So quit judging people by their bodies, because their bodies is not the real them. There's so much body shame, there's so much judgment on the external, but God doesn't look at the external alone, he looks at the internal. I'm getting ahead of myself, but what we want to talk to you today is about guarding your spirit. I got to put my spirit in a place, in an atmosphere where it can grow. I got to put my spirit in a place where I can be sensitive to the revivals of God and the moves of God. I need to make sure that I guard my spirit above all else, for out of it flows the issues of life. And so what the Bible says, check this out in Jeremiah 17, 9. Let's read some scriptures together. Are y'all ready? Come on, Gainesville. Are you ready? All of our campuses, Florida Mall, are you ready? Yes. Jeremiah 17, 9. Let's read it together. Ready to read? It says that the human heart is the most wicked and deceitful of all things and it's desperately wicked, who really knows how bad it is? <laughs> People say, well, pastor, you just can't help who you love. You know, the heart wants what the heart wants. I would say you need to crucify your heart because my Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked. And so just because your heart wants something doesn't mean that you're supposed to have it. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen up in this church today. Just because your heart really wants something doesn't mean that that something is good for you. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful of all things and is desperately wicked. Who really knows it? We have to put in the hard work of the heart work. If you go to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, let's read this one together. Are y'all ready? Ready to read? It says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord, he weighs the what? People would rather change the Bible than change their lifestyle. They would rather change and say, well, I just don't believe. I believe it's written by a man. I don't believe that you have to do that. I believe that's ancient and old. That means you just want to do whatever the heck you want to do. And the honest to God truth is that every way of a man is right in his own eyes. In his own eyes, contemporarily, what does this mean? As human beings, we are programmed to, to think that our stuff don't stink, but it does. As human beings, we are programmed to think that everybody else is wrong, but I'm okay with God. I don't have to come to church. I don't have to do all that tithing stuff. I don't have to do all that stuff they're talking about. I can live any old kind of way as long as I'm happy. You are programmed to be right in your own eyes. And there are many ways that seem right, but the end of those ways are death and destruction. And just because it seems right doesn't make it right because we can't be right in our eyes. We have to be right in his eyes, but we got to be willing to do the hard work. Come on, somebody, of the hard work. If you look at 1 Samuel 16, check this one out. 1 Samuel 16, are you guys there? Come on, Gainesville, let's read this together. All of our services, ready, go. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't look at the things that people look at. Ah, people look at the outward appearance. Come on. But the Lord looks at the what? Heart. All right? Now, we understand that this text is talking about the time where God chose, um, well, he had, he didn't choose, it was the people's choice. King Saul was anointed, then he, he rejected Saul, and he's looking for another king for Israel. And he goes, and he wants to find David, and he goes through all of his brothers, and he comes and he chooses David. And here's a few things that we learn. If you're taking notes, write this down. People focus more on external things while God focuses on the internal things. 
People focus more on external things while God focuses on the internal things. People will focus on your six-pack or your non-pack, your, your tan that you're getting. People will focus on your nose or your lips and you know, how you look. People will focus on external things, and maybe we should make sure that we take care of our temples. That's not what I'm saying. But don't focus on the external more than the internal because the internal is what's going to last for eternity. So there's too many of us that we're making judgments about people based upon how they look on the outside without knowing who they are on the inside. God doesn't look at people the way that men look at people. What do we learn from this? This is what else we learn. Write this down. Is that promotion will pass you by when your heart is not right. That promotion will pass you by when your heart is not right. God says, I need another king. Saul's not the one. There's pride on the inside of him. I reject him. I need to go find somebody else. Go to Jesse and go, and I'll tell you, Samuel, which one I want you to anoint. He goes to the older brother that looks the part. He's strong and he's handsome. And God is like, listen, I don't look at man like people look at man. I'm looking for the right heart. And he goes through all of David's brothers, and then he looks at Jesse, and he's like, listen, do you have anybody else? And he's like, who? The shepherd boy out with the sheep that's playing the harp? He's a creative. He's out there making music. His brothers don't want anything to do with him. Some of you all are here and your family don't want anything to do with you, but you still are anointed and appointed by God. It doesn't matter what people think about you. What does God say about you? And greater is he that's in you than he that is in this world. <laughs> and they come over and he says, he's the one. Pick who? David, the one with the right heart. The one that will be called one day a man after God's own heart. Not because he was perfect, but because he was pure hearted, he was chosen. There's something about having a pure heart. Some of you all are being passed up for promotion because your heart's not right. You're being passed up for increase at your job because your heart's not right. You're being passed up from promotion and ministry because your heart's not right. The favor of God should be thicker on your life, but it's not because your heart's not right. And today is a day where we got to do the hard work of the heart work so that we can not be passed up for the promotion that was supposed to be ours from the beginning. Come on, somebody. What do we learn from 1 Samuel? Write this down. We learned that God is looking for those for, with a pure heart. God is looking. Come on, he's looking for those with a pure heart. And if I was honest with you, as a lead pastor, I'm looking for those who have a pure heart. I'm looking. I'm in a season right now where we need more pastors. We need more ministry gifts. We need more kingdom builders. We need more leaders. We need more people who have the spirit of, the, of this house and like, okay, we're going to depopulate hell and populate heaven. And I'm looking for people with a pure heart. And I want you to know this, and this is just insider information. Sometimes I'll take pure hearted people over skill and experience any day of the week. You know, because I feel like I can teach skill, and hopefully, if you stick around long enough, we can get you some experience, but I can't teach people to have the right kind of heart. And sometimes I just look and say, is their heart right? I cannot use you because your heart's not there yet. Your heart's not right yet. In the same way that God is looking for people who have a pure heart, I'm looking for people who have a pure heart. Your supervisors are looking for people who have pure hearts. Head coaches of teams are just looking for people with heart. Y'all watch the Super Bowl? The 49ers had a quarterback. His name was Brock Purdy. He was picked up last in the NFL draft, but he just led his team to the Super Bowl. And if you really look at his story, people love him because he had heart. He didn't have the skill. He didn't have the height, but he had the heart. And heart makes up for a whole lot. You just want to be a person that when God looks at you, he says, this is a person just like David that has the right temperature of the heart. They are humble. They are servants. Come on. They are pliable. They are teachable. I don't care if you got your PhD or you humble enough to paint a wall. We want people that have the right heart. Are you with me today? If you go over to Psalms 51 and 10, Watch this one. You guys are going to like this one. Can we read this one together? All campuses, ready, read. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Wow. Do you know who's, who's this that was speaking? It was King David, y'all. And do you know when Psalms 51 was spoken? It was spoken after he messed up and had an adulterous affair with a woman named Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah put on the front lines and murdered. And then Nathan the prophet comes to David and is like, you done messed up. And some people in this generation say, uh-uh, that ain't right. That ain't a word for me. I can do whatever I want to do. I'm free to be me. David wasn't like that because he had a pure heart. What did he say? Oh, my God, I done sinned against God. And then in Psalms 51, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. And the good news is that there's second chances for imperfect people. Do I got any per imperfect people in the house? Come on, can I preach to imperfect people today? Do I got anybody that's made some mistakes? Do I got anybody that's committed some sins? Do I got anybody who's done some wrong things? The good news for those of us who are not perfect people is that we can come back to our Father at any time and say, God, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, and God gets to work. We were just at a conference with one of my overseers. His name is Randy Bazette, and we take our, our church down for a leadership conference down in Sarasota. And he was teaching this message, and there's a scripture in the Bible where it says that God repented that he had anointed Saul as king. God repented. And me and him, we were having this conversation of why would God need to repent? And the conclusion was is that God repented because Saul never repented meaning that God can establish you in something and then he repents that he gave you that gift if you never repent. In contrast, David messed up worse than Saul. Think, what did Saul do? He was a little hard to lead, a little prideful, throwing a javelin at David, chasing him around from cave to cave. But David was an adulterous murderer. But we still know his name as a man after God's own heart. Why? David repented, but Saul didn't. There are some of you all, you're too proud. you got to understand that revival comes on the hills of repentance. God is just looking for the pliable, humble people that have childlike faith. I'm looking in the camera right now to preach to you online. Are you hearing me today? Create in me a clean heart, oh God. That, that means i got to go home and i got to do the hard work. i got to do the hard work of the hard work. I give you one of my favorite scriptures right now is Matthew 5 and 8. And it's just, you know, this was my pastor's favorite scripture years ago. And like, it took me 25 years to realize why it was his favorite scripture, but now I get it. Let's read it together. Ready, read it. It says, blessed are the pure in heart. Ah. And he would say, that's my favorite scripture. And I was like, okay, that's not the deepest scripture I've ever seen. Let's see. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How many of you all want to see God? I don't know about you. I don't want to read about God. I want to see God. I don't want to just have God in the UK. I want to have God in the US. I don't want to just talk about the healing. I want to see the healing. I want to see the blinded eye open. I want to see the leper cleansed. I want to see God in my finances. I want to see God. The Bible says this, for those who know their God, he will show himself strong and do great exploits. Anybody here want to see the exploits again? I want to see God in my marriage. I want to see God in my parenting. I want to see God in our small groups. I want to see God in our huddles and our rallies. I want to see God in our dream team. Come on, so I want to see God in our worship set. I want to see God. I want to see God. I don't want to read about God. I want to see God. But watch this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It's not everybody that's seeing God. It's the people that are pure-hearted that's going to see God. It's not a suggestion. It's actually a promise from God that if you can get your heart right and keep your heart right, you will see the manifestation of Elohim and everything that you have going on. And we want to be known as a church that sees God show up. We need everybody here to say, okay, God, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. We got to do the hard work of the hard work. And we come back to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, and this is where we began our journey through Scripture today. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Let's read it one more time. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do. Above all else, this gives it priority. You're working on a lot in your life right now, but please don't miss this instruction. Guard your, guard your, guard your, guard your, for everything you do flows from it. One translation says, for out of it flows the interest, the issues of life. Some of the issues, it's you. It's the offense, it's the bitterness, it's the prejudice, it's the judgment, it's the fear, it's the unbelief, it's the skepticism. Why do I have all these issues? The issues, it's you. You got to go in and do the hard work of the, of the hard work. Above all else, guard. Everybody say guard. You got to put some guards around your heart. I got to guard my heart. Think of a shield and a soldier and a sword. You got to guard this. Everything is flowing out of my core. It is flowing out of my being. My anointing is right here. That means that I 
I have to put some protection. It does matter what atmospheres I'm in. It does matter who I hang out with because people are carriers of seed and, and, and your words are spirit in life. I can't handle everybody sowing their negative seeds into the ground of my heart. I have to guard my heart above all else because my life follows that direction one translation says. Are you with me today? So here's the question, how? How do we guard our heart? If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. ready. I'm going to give you three ways. There's more ways, but I'll give you three for today. Number one, write this down, is don't be afraid of the hard work. Instead, you got to embrace it. (laughs) Somebody say, I got to embrace it. You got to start to enjoy hard work. Some of y'all been running from hard work. You just been running because you're so lazy, you don't want to do the hard work. Some of you all are overweight, and I'm not dissing you. I'm not talking about you being what a magazine tells you're supposed to be, meaning that when you go to the doctor, they say that you're overweight, meaning that you're out of, your, your health is not right, and you don't want to do the hard work of putting down certain foods. It don't matter. Y'all nervous. Keep looking at me because I'm not. <laughs> you don't want to do the hard work of getting on that treadmill. You don't want to do the hard work of passing by KFC, McDonald's. You don't want to do the hard work of meal prepping. You don't want to do the hard work. But if you want to be around and carry the glory of God and to, as a grandparent and a great-grandparent, if you want to see your grandkids and your great grand you got to do the hard work. you got to start to embrace the hard work. You've been made for hard things. Nobody's clapping in this service. We'll see what happens at the other one. If you want to get out of debt, you got to do the hard work. You got to live beneath your means. You got to quit shopping and impulse buying. You got to stop living on credit cards. Come on, somebody. You got to have margin. You got to increase margin. You might have to work a little bit of overtime. I don't know what's going on with a generation that's scared of hard work. What what in the world is happening? We want everything so easy. You got to start to embrace. This is going to be hard, but I've been made for hard things. I've been made for, watch this, marriage is going to be hard. Parenting is hard. Building a church is hard. Starting another campus is hard. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard. But his grace is sufficient for us to be able to do hard things. It's okay, it's hard. I've been made for hard things. Come on, somebody. I didn't know it was going to be that hard. Newsflash, it is. Anything that's worth anything is going to be hard. You've been made for hard things. It's okay. Just because it's hard doesn't mean you got to run from it. If you're going to have the right heart, you're going to have to do the hard work. It's hard work to deal with the trauma of your past. It's hard work to deal with your triggers that cause you to go angry and go crazy and just ghost people. It's hard work to dig deep and deal with why you're really depressed. It's hard work to deal with why, why, why you're supposed to be the hope of the world, but you are completely hopeless. It's hard work to deal with why you don't trust other people. It's hard work why you can't keep a job over 12 months and you from job to job and church to church. We would rather just blame it on the church. We would rather say, no, I just don't like the pastor in his green jacket. We would rather blame everybody else other than do the hard work of the heart work. And it's all in here, y'all. It's always been in the core of you. Can you submit to leadership? Can you be faithful in your marriage even when you feel like not being faithful? Can you keep your word when it would be convenient and to your advantage to tell a little white lie? Can you be different than everybody else that is in this world? Can you do the hard work? Do I got anybody in these campuses that are ready to embrace? Come on, bring it on. Come on, bring it on, bring on the hard work. I'm not scared of therapy, I'm going in. I'm going in, praise God. Get up in here, paying you to get up in here and tell me what I need to do, praise God. Grown man, been married 25 years, still go to counseling every month. It's not because I can't counsel, it's because I need to do the hard work of my heart work. I can't just say I had a, a good heart back Back in the day when we had a Gainesville campus, no, I need to have a good heart when we have a South Africa campus and a Brazil campus and a London campus. I need to still have a good heart. See, you you don't grow out of doing the hard work. Number two, how do I do the hard work? Number two, write this down, is that you got to decrease the secular and increase the sacred. You got to decrease the secular and increase the sacred. You got to decrease because, watch this, y'all with me today? Say, I'm with you, Pastor. (laughs) It's the ear gate and the eye gate that's affecting what's in your heart. 
And when the scripture says guard your heart, the way you guard your heart is by guarding your ears and guarding what you see. Let me translate this for me. That means that I don't listen to any music and I don't watch any movies because I don't want them affecting what's in my core. And it's not because of legalism, it's only because of discipline and I know what I'm working with. And some of you all got too much toxins that you allow in in the, in the name of entertainment. I had a nine hour flight back from the UK. And the, uh, the, the night before I was in the UK, <clears throat> I'm on a five hour advance in time. So it's 3 a.m. there and like 10, 10 or so here, you know, something like that, you know, do, do the math. So maybe it's one and it's, I don't know, I ain't got time to do math right now, I gotta preach and move on. Um, and I'm, I'm just looking for something American on TV. You know, they're, they're using accents and I can only understand some of what they're saying. And um, I said, I just need something American. And the only thing I could find at the moment was the Oscars. So I turned on the Oscars and I'm watching it. I'm like, thank God for America. And I noticed that Oppenheimer won like seven Oscars. I'm sitting there like, man, best sound, best actor, wow. So I got a nine hour flight. So I get on the plane and I'm like, I'm gonna find Oppenheimer. And I turned on the movie and I said, man, this is gonna be good cinematic production. It's gonna be great acting and everything. And I was getting into it for a minute until I ran into the sex scenes and the nudity scenes. Until I saw boobies jumping around and a woman on top of another man. And I thought to myself, oh my God. And your flesh is like, should I pause this or should I rewind it? Because nobody else is around. Because your flesh wants garbage. Your flesh wants the world. That's why it has to be crucified daily and you give no provision to the flesh. So I'm thinking in my little cabin, I'm like, ain't nobody around here, I'm 3,000 miles in the air. I ain't seen my wife in about a week. Uh, there's boobies jumping around everywhere. And my flesh is like, yes, I fast forwarded, right? And I said, well, maybe, maybe that was it. And then there was another sex scene, another new, and, and I didn't finish the movie. But you say, why is that? Because I'm decreasing the secular. And I gotta be honest with you, I usually don't watch rated R movies. Y'all know I've said that over the years. I've re-fortified that line even more. Like, they have no place in me. You can do whatever you want to do, and I don't want you to be the judgmental crew that's going judging other people walking out of the movie theater. Like, Look, did you see Sister So-and-So? Can you believe they were in there? No, you got to put your own guards around your own heart. But I am a spiritual coach, and I'm going to set a bar that you can come up if you want to or stay wherever you want to. I don't care. But for me, if it's over PG-13, I know it ain't good for me. Like, I've been married 25 years. I don't need to see another woman's boobies. I don't need to see another woman grinding another man. It does not help my relationship with Jesus. It does not make me holier. It does not give me eternal value. I love entertainment, but not that kind of entertainment. Come on, somebody. You got to guard your heart. So for me, for me, I don't watch rated R movies. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't listen to music with the explicit label on it. None of it helps me at all. Do whatever you want to do, but I'm just trying to take you higher. You got to guard your ears and your eyes to guard your heart. Okay? But you know what a lot of people hear in this one? When I say decrease the secular, increase the sacred, we stop at decreasing the secular. But the key is not just decreasing the secular. The key is increasing the sacred. Some of us, we don't read the Bible enough. You don't study the Bible enough. You don't meditate on the Word of God enough. You don't listen to these preached messages enough. It's one thing to say no to something, but what are you saying yes to? See, you got to be a good farmer of your heart, and you got to sow the Word of God, not just on Sundays. See, what people do on Sundays is they come to here and they get their hope hit. Hit me, Pastor, because I know you've been studying. Give me a hope. Make me feel good about myself until Monday comes. And Tuesday comes and Wednesday comes. Then you got to come to Sunday if you can get through the traffic and it ain't raining to give me another hope hit. And we don't want to be your hope pushers. We want you to go and hit your own hope Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Come on, somebody. Get the Bible. Get out your Bibles again, you guys. Study the Bible. Meditate on the Bible. Quote the Bible. Instead of binge watching Love is Blind, binge watch a live church because I know. I know I almost fell into that too. What happened was, <laughs> and at the end of it, you're thinking, why have I wasted all of these hours of my life in other people's drama? You know I want to preach about it, but I can't right now. <laughs> Got to increase the sacred. 
Spend time in the Bible, man. Binge watch. We got a live church app. You can listen to messages from five years ago. We got doing life with Ken and Tabitha. We drop dimes every Thursday. I was talking to one brother. He didn't even know we had a podcast. He'd been at church five years. He's like, really? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know. Like, where are you? Where have you been? And last but not least, watch this. Number three, you write, write this one down. And this is, this, is the, this is the big one here. You got to set some boundaries for yourself. Come on, y'all. If you want to have a pure heart, if you want to see God, you got to set boundaries for yourself. All right? What is a guard? It is a boundary. It's a parameter. It's you making the decision. There are certain things that you don't do because it's not healthy for you. I think nowadays people, they set the boundaries over here, right? Let me see if I can do this. Y'all watch me. Uh, uh, this is the boundary. Bada bing. Check this out. And this is what a boundary is. And the Bible says don't do all of these different things. And if you cross this, it's sin. And where the average Christian likes to be is right here. <laughs> like, it, come on, it, right here. Like, I, I'm not drunk really. I, I, I know I'm a little buzzed, but that's not drunk yet. I, I, I know, I know, I know, you know, no, I'm not tithing. I will later on right now. I'm, you know, right now, God knows my heart. And, and we love to be on the edge of stuff. And if we, just, if we blow you, you're just going to fall in the sin. <laughs> well, the Bible don't say that I can't vape. The Bible don't say I can't smoke cigars. Well, I'm just inhaling, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not inhaling all the way down. So I'm just going to be over here. You know, weed is from the, you know, the, in Genesis, it talks about herb, how God gives herbs. So, you know, that's okay. You know, God made herbs. <laughs> I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen up in this church. <laughs> you are right here. Why is your boundary all the way over here? Because of what the Bible don't say. The Bible don't say a lot of stuff. The Bible don't say you can't play the lotto. The Bible don't say you can't masturbate. The Bible don't say you don't see a this and that. You see principles that would suggest that certain things might not be wise. But if you live your life on the edge of boundary, you will soon be in Sodom and Gomorrah. If you pitch your tent this way, come on, Leslie Pierce, you will soon be in Sodom and Gomorrah. So for those of us who know who we are, we don't set the boundary over there. Come on, somebody. We set boundaries over here. So you say, Pastor Ken, well, how do you live? I live over here. So if I happen to go over here, I'm still far away from sin. <laughs> I live, and you know what this is? This is called the gray area. And 10 years ago, I wrote a book that I never published called Live Beyond the Gray. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, you need to bring this book out and take it around the world. Because there's too many believers now and day under grace. You're living in the gray. But your, evil, your good is being evil spoken of. You're not living a life that is beyond reproach. You're not living a life that is blameless. It is permissible, but it is not wise. It is, does not add eternal value to you because it's in the gray. For me and Tabitha, we live beyond the gray. That means that I'm way far from the Egypt state line. I'm far from Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm living way over this way. So... I feel like the Lord's been telling me to share my testimony more, so here it comes, all right? I'm happy to say that I have been sober now for 23 years. 23 years. 23 years. 23 years. No drugs, no alcohol at all. No matter what environment, no matter who's around me, no matter what, I don't care. Because this is why. I have seen people take a little bit of glass of wine, into a whole glass, and a two, and two glasses, and three glasses, and then we checking them out of rehab. Pastors, leaders, people who have great anointings, losing their churches, losing their marriages, because they're not living sober-minded. The Bible in Proverbs says that kings and princes sustain from strong drink. I look at myself as a king, it just matters how you look at yourself. And since because I'm a person of authority, I don't care about what I get to do. Yes, I can do it. It's not a sin for me to drink, but it's not wise for me. So I do whatever you want to do, but for me, I'm happy to say I've been sober for 23 years. Come on, somebody. No. Y'all don't understand what I just said. All right. 
let, let, let me just take it another step further because for the sake of time, I haven't watched any pornography in 20 years, 23 years, flirted with another woman in 23 years, not tithed in 23 years, not observed the Sabbath in 23 years. Why? Because I've been working on the purity of my heart for 23 years and I will continue to work for 33 years, 43 years, 53 years, and you get, don't get upset with me when I see God because blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. I'm living a life that other people just don't want to live because the world is too attractive to the church. But listen, the world has nothing that it can offer us. We should have the joy of the Lord. We should be free to be who God called us to be. I don't need a happy hour to get happy. I came in happy. I'm leaving out happy. I keep my $7. Come on, somebody. I'm going to keep my $7. I know people ain't preaching this. I don't get in a car with another woman. Why? Because I got mine, and I don't need to be tempted looking at her. You can say you're weak. No, I say I'm smart. I'm protecting my anointing with a boundary. That ain't in the Bible, but I still need a boundary. Oh, I got to go. I said that in the UK, in an atmosphere where there's a pub on every corner. A pub on every corner. I said, I don't need a happy hour to get happy. These kids jumped up like, I ain't never heard that before. <laughs> it was so liberating. This is how the spirit fell. They was like, we ain't got to go to the happy hour to get happy. And I said, the joy of the Lord is here. And the Lord gave us a prophetic song, you got that joy. And they started dancing, and they jumped down here. And listen, we were so drunk in the spirit. And we ain't going to have a hangover on the next day. And I'm not leaving out with another woman because I'm inebriated. Listen. I need to see Acts chapter 2 show up now. I need to see Acts chapter 2 where people are like, these people aren't drunk like you suppose. It's been the outpour of the Holy Ghost. Do I got anybody in Gainesville that knows I'm preaching to you truth up in this place? Woo! Glory! <laughs> I tested y'all just now. Somebody should have ran up here and did the do si Y'all ain't ready yet in America. Just get ready though. Because that's the thing. We clap. But we don't know when the water's stirring. We don't know when the water's stirring. And some of us are like, listen, I got to get home real quick. Yeah, and that's what stops the move of God. If we can have a hungry church that knows what God's done before he wants to do again. Don't do it now. But what I'm saying is let's get ready for what God wants to do. Now, I got to go. I feel like I've preached beyond my time. Have you guys enjoyed the word today? Come on. Come on, Gainesville. All of our services, Florida, all these campus. Come on. Tampa, we love you. Come on, would you put your hands together for what God's doing in the house? Come on, y'all, let's get going. Glory! Glory! I want to give you an opportunity to kind of get some things right. I believe we can have an emotional time and a spiritual time, and I believe that we should worship God with our emotions. Some people will say, well, it just seems like you're emotional. I will say, well, you don't know how to worship God with your emotions, and that's a sad place to be. But I don't want it just to be emotionalism. I don't want it to be that. I want you to make some good decisions today to say, God, I want to have a right heart towards you. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Do something new on the inside of me. And the first step towards that will be accepting Jesus as the Lord of your life. The Bible says that when you get born again, he takes away the stony heart and he replaces it with the heart of flesh. When you say yes to Jesus, that's the only way for you to have a new heart. That's the only way for you to have a new spirit. When you are born naturally, you are born spiritually dead to God because of our sin. That's why eight million billion people around the world need to get born again. What does that mean? The same power that rose Jesus from the dead now steps into your spirit and makes dead things come alive again. Ooh, glory. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today on the count of three and you're humble enough to say, Pastor, I've sinned, but I want forgiveness. I want to be like David. I want to say, God created me a clean heart. I would love to pray with you. All over the building, you say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to take a step of faith. On the count of three, please lift up your hand all over our buildings and just wave at me on the count of three if that's you and you say, pray with me. Pastor, pray with me. Please lift up your hand in one, two, Three, all over the building, all of our services. Just lift, lift up your hand and just wave at me. I see your hand and 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 your hand in Gainesville and all of our services. God sees your hand.
God sees your hand. There's no distance in the spirit. And let's pray this prayer together where you call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says when you do that, you'll be saved. Let's say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sin. I repent of my way. And I ask you for a new heart. Jesus, be my Lord. Be my Savior. I believe you died so that I could live forever with you. I accept you as the Lord of my life, the Savior of my soul. I'm yours. You're mine. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in a live church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right. If you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow to the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.